Hello, class. Good to see you again. Did you miss me? It's been a while. Everybody, this is part 2A of the fourth book, Call the Doctor. But before we start the episode, make sure to like and subscribe. Let's go. Everyone, help save lives. The Red Cross First Aid Quiz. And this is the website. I need you to look at the six quiz questions and with a partner decide what the highlighted words might mean and use the pictures to help you. Now I need you to take the quiz with your partner and you can check your answers, well, you know the drill, on Google or on the Red Cross webpage. Well done, you did good on the quiz. But let's check your information about illnesses and Injuries. All right. Minor illnesses and conditions. Match the sentences with the pictures. This is your gig. Take your time and do it yourself. Very good. And if you have done it, check your answers with your friends, as always. Let's do it together. 1.29 Minor illnesses and conditions. A. 9. A cough. 6. A headache. 1. A rash. 4. A temperature. 2. Sunburn. 8. She's sick. She's vomiting. 10. She's sneezing. 3. Her ankle is swollen. 7. Her back hurts. Her back aches. 5. Her finger is bleeding. Well done. You did great. But we're not done yet. Follow me. Now match the illnesses and conditions with their symptoms or causes. Okay, for example, he has a sore throat. B. It hurts when he talks or swallows food. All right, take your time and match them. The symptoms, the things that sh show the sickness, that show the illness. All right, very good. Take your time. Okay, now again, listen and check. 1.30 C. 1. B. He has a sore throat. It hurts when he talks or swallows food. 2. D. He has diarrhea. He's been to the bathroom five times this morning. 3. E. He feels sick. He feels like he's going to vomit. 4. C. He's fainted. It's so hot in the room that he's lost consciousness. 5. H. He has a blister on his foot. He's been walking in uncomfortable shoes. 6. F. He has a cold. He's sneezing a lot and he has a cough. 7. A. He has the flu. He has a temperature and he aches all over. 8. G. He feels dizzy. He feels that everything is spinning around. 9. I. He's cut himself. He's bleeding. All right, very good. You did good as always. But again, there's another one. Follow me. Now, my friends, injuries and more serious conditions. Yeah, it's not like your normal cough or flu, all right? I need you to again match the injuries with their causes or symptoms. For example, he's unconscious. C. He's breathing, but his eyes are closed and he can't hear or feel anything. You know the drill. 
And look, before we start, look, common treatments for a cut. Minor, put band-aid and antibiotics ointments. Major, get stitches. Headaches, take painkillers. An infection, take antibiotics. A sprained ankle, put ice on it and bandage it. And an allergic reaction, take antihistamine tablets or apply cream. So, we have some treatments as well. Sometimes your mama helps you with a headache, for example. All right. Now, I need you to take your time and match them. And if you have done it, all right, very good. Listen and check. Let's do it. 1.31 Injuries and more serious conditions. 1. C. He's unconscious. He's breathing, but his eyes are closed and he can't hear or feel anything. 2. G. He's had an allergic reaction. He was stung by a wasp and now he has a rash and has difficulty breathing. 3. B. He's twisted his ankle. He's sprained his ankle. He fell badly and now it's swollen. 4. D. He has high blood pressure. It's 180 over 140. 5. E. He has food poisoning. He ate some chicken that wasn't fully cooked. 6. F. He's choking. He was eating a steak and a piece got stuck in his throat. 7. A. He burned himself. He spilled some boiling water on himself. Well, God forbid if any of these happen to you, stay safe out there. Now, this is the last set in the vocabulary part. I know, I know it's getting boring. I know. This is the last set. Phrasal verbs connected with illness. All right. Match the bold phrasal verbs to their meanings. Okay, let me read it for you. Please lie down on the table. I'm going to examine you. I'd been standing for such a long time that I passed out. And when I came around, I was lying on the floor. It usually takes a long time to get over the flu. A few minutes after drinking the liquid, I had to run to the bathroom to throw up. All right. So match these bold phrases with their meanings. Use the context to help you check with your friends learn from each other now listen and check 1.32 phrasal verbs connected with illness 1 pass out means faint 2 lie down means put your body in a horizontal position 3 Throw up means vomit, be sick. 4. Get over means get better, recover from something. 5. Come around means become conscious again. All right, very good, everyone. You did great. Let's move on. Everyone, read these words with me. Sh, shower, short. Dishwasher, selfish, cash, sugar, sure, machine, chef, ambitious, explanation, spacious, sociable, j, jazz, jealous, just, generous, manager, bridge, judge, ch, chess, change, cheat, watch, match, picture, future, K, key, court, script, kind, kick, track, lucky, chemistry, school, stomach, squid, account. All right. You can practice them as much as possible because we have some business to do. Follow me. Now that you know, I need you to put these in here. Take your time. Stop the video and do it. And if you have done it, 
Listen and check with me. Let's go. 1.33 Shower Sh Pressure Rash Unconscious Jazz J Allergy Bandage Chess Ch Choking Temperature Key K Ache Ankle Stomach All right, and that's all there is to it. Practice them, and let me tell you, you don't need to memorize anything. Just try to make sentences with these words. Use them. That's better. Now it's getting interesting. And as you can see, I have my own headphones on as well. Look at some more words related to illness and injury. Which ones are similar in your language? Do you know what the other ones mean? All right. Now, here are some of them. And I want to listen with you because I may not be as good as you even. All right. So listen and practice saying these words. Let's do it. 1.34 Antibiotics Symptom Medicine Emergency Operation Aspirin Specialist Acetaminophen X-ray Cholesterol Injection CAT scan And as I told you, some of them are actually in your language. But the pronunciation may be different. Try to practice saying them in English. You did great. All right, everyone. After all that, it's time to talk. Ask and answer the questions with a partner. Number one. What injuries or illnesses could you get when you are cooking, when you are playing sports, or when you are eating in a restaurant? Have you have any of these things ever happened to you? All right. Number two, have you ever been in a situation where you had to give first aid? Who to? Why? What happened? How much do you know about first aid? Where did you learn it? Has anyone ever had to give you first aid? What happened? Number three, what do you think you should do if someone has a very high temperature? Someone is stung by a wasp and has an allergic reaction. And or someone has very bad sunburn. All right, what do you do in these situations? I need you to speak with your friends and compare your answers. Share your experiences. Who knows? Maybe one day you have to save a life. All the way to grammar. You made it so far. Impressive work. Everybody, I need you to listen to a conversation between a doctor and a patient. What symptoms does the patient have? And what does the doctor suggest? Okay? So I need you to listen and answer these questions. Let's go. 1.35 Good morning, Mr. Blaine. What's the problem? I haven't been feeling well for a few days. I keep getting headaches and I've been coughing a lot too. And I have a temperature. Have you been taking anything for the headaches? Yes, acetaminophen. But it doesn't really help. I read on the internet that headaches can be the first symptom of a brain tumor. How many tablets have you taken so far today? I took two this morning. And have you taken your temperature this morning? Yes, I've taken it five or six times. It's high. Let me see. Well, your temperature seems to be perfectly normal now. I think I need a blood test. I haven't had one for two months. Well, Mr. Blaine, you know... I think we should wait for a few days and see how your symptoms develop. Can you send the next patient in, please, nurse?
All right, very good. So check your answers with your friends. His symptoms are headaches, a cough, and a temperature. All right. The doctor suggests he should wait a few days to see how his symptoms develop. Because the man asked for a blood test, but the, the doctor refused. Well, it's the reverse these days. When you go into a hospital first, they take your blood, they do the tests, because they need the money money, if you know what I mean. Yeah! All right. <laughs> I'm just joking. I have deep respect for doctors, nurses, and the people who treat us. They are the heroes. Now, I need you to listen again and fill in the blanks with a verb in the present perfect simple or present perfect continuous. Let's do it. 1.35 Good morning, Mr. Blaine. What's the problem? I haven't been feeling well for a few days. I keep getting headaches and I've been coughing a lot too. And I have a temperature. Have you been taking anything for the headaches? Yes, acetaminophen. But it doesn't really help. I read on the internet that headaches can be the first symptom of a brain tumor. How many tablets have you taken so far today? I took two this morning. And have you taken your temperature this morning? Yes, I've taken it five or six times. It's high. Let me see. Well, your temperature seems to be perfectly normal now. I think I need a blood test. I haven't had one for two months. Well, Mr. Blaine, you know... I think we should wait for a few days and see how your symptoms develop. Can you send the next patient in, please, nurse? Well, you know, in these cases, oh, I think I have a tumor, oh, maybe it's the symptom, maybe it's cancer. This is hysteria, being afraid and just making things up in your brain. Don't be like that. Exercise and eat well. And you'll be doing just fine. All right. Now, I need you to listen to what the doctor and nurse say after Mr. Blaine has left. What do they think of him? All right. So, listen. They are talking. What do they think of him? Right. Let's go. 1.36. Your next patient is Mrs. Williams. Here are her notes. How many times has Mr. Blaine been to the health center this week? Uh, four times, I think. Yes, I know. He's a complete... Hypochondriac. All right, so what does this word mean? I need you to go and uh, check it in Google. It's important. Now, one more thing. Look at the sentences and circle the correct verb form. Check if you think both forms are possible. Let's do it together, me and you. Have you been taking anything for the headaches? Have you taken anything for the headaches? I think both of them are, yeah, correct. How many tablets have you been taking or taken? What is your answer? Well, it's taken. And follow me, I'll explain it to you completely. And I mean completely. Ladies and gentlemen, Present perfect simple and continuous. All right, listen first. 1.37 1. Have you ever written a blog? 2. We've landed, but we haven't gotten off the plane yet. I've already told you three times. 3. It's the best book I've ever read. Four. I've known Keiko since I was a child. My sister has had the flu for 10 days now. Five. How many Patricia Cornwell novels have you read? They've seen each other twice this week. Now, this is what we call the present perfect simple. We use this mode to talk about past experiences when we don't say the exact time. So something happened in the past, but the time is not clear. Number two, with yet and already. Have you seen him yet? I've already done it three times. With superlatives and the first, second, last time, etc. Number four, 
with non-action verbs. Do you remember them? Verbs not usually used in the continuous form. For example, be, have, know, like, etc. To say that something started in the past and is still true now. This is common with time expressions like how long, for, or since, all day, evening, etc. And one more thing, don't use the simple present or continuous in this situation. You can't say, I know Kiko, Kiko since I was a child. Okay, it's not true. And one last thing, when we say or ask how much or how many we have done or how often we have done something up to now. All right, we covered the present perfect simple, but we need to cover the next one, the continuous form. Follow me, there's more. Now, as for present perfect continuous, have or has plus been plus verb plus ing. Oh, it's boring. But first listen, I will explain it little by little. All right, let's go. 1.38 1. How long have you been feeling sick? He's been chatting online all evening. 2. I haven't been sleeping well. It's been raining all day. 3. I've been shopping all morning. I'm exhausted. Take your shoes off. They're filthy. Yes, I know. I've been working in the yard. Okay, very good. So, we use the present perfect continuous in these situations. One, with action verbs to say that an action started in the past and is still happening now. This use is common with time expressions like how long, for or since, all day, evening, etc. And don't use simple present or continuous in this situation. You can't say, I know Kiko since I was a child. Again, that's the system. For repeated actions, especially with a time expression, all day, recently, all right? And for continuous action that have just finished, but that have present results, there are some results present, okay? And one more thing, yeah, listen to this part as well. 1.39 1. I've been learning French for the last three years. He's liked classical music since he was a teenager. 2. She's been having a good time at school. They've had that car for at least 10 years. 3. We've lived in this town since 1980. We've been living in a rented house for the last two months. 4. I've painted the kitchen. I've been painting the kitchen. All right, very good. Now, you may say, what is the difference between these two? Well, to talk about an unfinished action, we usually use the present perfect continuous with action verbs and the present perfect simple with non-action verbs. Yeah. And some verbs can be action or non-action depending on their meaning. For example, have a good time, it's action. Have a car, it's non-action. And as for the third part, with the verbs like live or work, you can often use the present perfect, simple or continuous. However, we usually use the present perfect continuous for shorter, much temporary actions. And the last one, the present perfect simple emphasizes the completion of an action. The kitchen has been painted. The present perfect continuous emphasizes the duration of an action that may or may not be finished. The painting of the kitchen may not be finished yet. So, with the present perfect simple, something happened in the past, all right? We don't know what when it happens, but with present perfect continuous, it's like this. Something started in the past, the exact time we don't know. Continued, it may be finished, but there are some results, or it may continue. That's all there is to it for these two. Now... If you have understood everything, you can take screenshots to help you.
let's practice. As always, I have two sets of exercises for you. In the first one, I need you to circle the correct form of the verb and check if both of them are possible. And in the second one, I need you to complete the sentences with the best form of the verb in parentheses. Present perfect simple or continuous. It's your choice. As always, I need you to stop the video, take your time and do it yourself. Show me your talents. Very good. Now, if you have done it, check it with your friends, learn from each other, and it's my turn. Very good. Number one, she worked here since July. She's been working here since July. Both of them are correct. Number two, your mother has called three times the, this morning. Number three, the kids are exhausted because they have been running around all day. Number four, Tim and Lucy haven't seen our new house. Number five, I've never met her boyfriend, have you? Number six, it's been raining all morning. Number seven, we've already had lunch. Number eight, my sister has been living alone since her divorce or has lived. Both of them are correct. Now, as for the first one, number one, we, we've known Jack and Anne for years. Number two, you look really hot. Have you been working out at the gym? Hmm. Number three, Emily hasn't done her homework yet, so she can't go out. Number four, they don't live in Miami. They've moved. Number five, I haven't had time to cook anything. Number six, We've been walking for hours. Is this the right way? All right. Number seven. Have you been reading my diary again? And number eight. Oh, no. I've cut my finger on this knife. Very good. You did great. If you need further practice, there are so many practices online. Or just email me. I'll provide you with more. Let's continue. Great. You made it so far. Now look at numbers 1 to 8, very good, very nice. With your friends, I need you to form questions. Take your time and do it. I'll be waiting for you. A few moments later. Okay, you're back. So these are the questions. Number 1, do you often get colds? How many colds have you had in the last 3 months? Alright. Number 2. Are you taking any vitamins or supplements right now? How long have you been taking them? All right, or vitamins, you can say as well. Number three, do you drink much water? How many glasses have you drunk today? Number four, do you play any sports? What do you play? How long have you been playing them? Playing tennis or going to the gym, etc. Number five, do you eat a lot of fruit and vegetables? How many servings have you had today? Number six. Do you walk to school or work or how far have you walked today? For example, I have this smartwatch which tells me all about it. So you can use the same technique. Number seven. How many hours do you sleep at night? Have you been sleeping well recently? And number eight. Are you allergic to anything? Have you ever had a serious allergic reaction? All right. I need you to write your answers to these questions. Very good. And I need you to speak with your friends, compare your answers, share your ideas. Very good. Everyone, it's time for some writing. An informal email. Look, beginning an informal email. When you're writing an informal email, it is more usual to start with hi than with dear. Okay, so that's very important. Now read the email from Anna. All right, you see, take care, Anna. It has 12 highlighted mistakes, four grammar or vocabulary, four punctuation, and four spelling. And with a partner, decide what kind of mistake each one is and correct it. Okay, again, it's your turn. I'll be waiting for you. A few minutes later. Great, now let's fix it together. Hi, Olivia. Sorry that I haven't been in touch for a while 
but I've been sick. I got the flu last week and I had a temperature. So what is the problem here? Yeah, temperature, All right? Of 102 degrees Fahrenheit. So I've been in bed for four days. I'm feeling a little better today. So I've been catching up on my emails. Luckily, my college classes don't start until next week. How are you? What have you been doing? Anything exciting? Here, everyone is fine, apart from me and my flu. My brother, my brother Mike started a new job with a software company. I think I told you about it when I wrote last time. Anyway, he's really enjoying it. How's your family? I hope they're well. I have some good news. I'm going to a conference in your town in May. Use the capital letter for, the, for month. From the 16th to 20th. Could you recommend a hotel where I could stay near the downtown area? It needs to be somewhere not too expensive because my college is paying. I'll have a free half day for sightseeing. Do you think... You'll be able to show me around? That would be great. Well, that's all for now. Please give my regards to your family. Hope to hear from you soon. Take care, Anna. Very good. Not bad. Now, look, read Anna's email again and find sentences that mean I haven't written or called. All right. What is the first one? This sentence. I haven't written or called. I haven't been in touch. Yeah. Yeah. I've been reading and replying to my emails, all right? You can say, I've been catching up on my emails. Okay, and last one, have you been doing anything exciting? All right, you can say, what have you been doing? Anything exciting? Very good, but we're not done. Follow me. Now, you're going to answer Anna's email, but, but before that, I need you to try and complete these expressions with your friend. You can do it together, you can check Google, whatever you want to do, do it. I'll be waiting for you, again. 12 seconds later. Okay, one by one, opening expressions. Thanks for your email or letter. It was great to hear from you. Sorry for not writing earlier. Sorry that I haven't been in touch for a while. I hope you and your family are well. Responding to news. Sorry to hear about your final grades. Glad to hear that you're all well. Good luck with that new job. Hope you feel better soon or you are better soon or you get better soon. Closing expressions. Anyway, well, that's all. For now, hope to hear from you soon. Looking forward to hearing from you soon. All right. Give my regards or love to. All right. And take care. Best wishes or best regards. Lots of love. And last one. P.S. P.S. means postscript. Something you forgot or you want to add. Please send me pictures you promised, for example. Very good. Now you have the expressions you need. You can take a screenshot from this. Let's go. Now it's time to plan the content of your informal email to your friend Anna or someone you know. First, I need you to underline the questions in the email that Anna wants you to answer. Then underline other places in the email where you think you need to respond. For example, I've been sick. All right. Very good. Answer these two questions. Take your time. For the first one, look, how are you? What have you been doing? Anything exciting? How's your family? Could you recommend the hotel? Do you think you'll be able to show me around? All right. And for the next one, look, brother's new job. Yeah, the conference. All right. Now I need you to think and organize your email. All right. You can write 120 to 180 words. In two or three paragraphs, you can use informal language, contractions, etc., and expressions. All right, very good. The rest is your gig. Not gonna lie, you did a great job on that email. But right now we're here. 
to my favorite part, reading. First, look at the title of the article. How would you define a hypochondriac? And what do you think a cyberchondriac is? You can Google it, look it up. Very good. Take a look at it. Read the article a little bit. I won't bother you. Awesome. So, as you can probably see, a cyberchondriac is someone who spends hours on the internet trying to diagnose their symptoms and then imagines that they have a serious condition. Oh boy. Very good. Now, I need you to read the article again. We have uh, some topic sentences. A, B, C, D, E. All right? And they tell me, Teacher, what is a topic sentence? Well, topic sentences. In a well-written article, each paragraph usually begins with a topic sentence that tells you what the paragraph is about. Well, honestly speaking, we call it main idea. The main idea is usually in the first sentence, and the other sentences support the main idea. Very good. Take your time, read the article, and match the topic sentences to the paragraph. I'll wait again. Six and a half hours later. All right, you know what time it is. A few weeks ago, I was feeling under the weather. After days of internet, uh, intensive internet diagnosis, I finally went to see my GP, general practitioner, the doctor. After examining me, she told me that my heart rate was a little fast and sent me off to the ER. To have some tests done. Did I go straight there? Of course not. First I took out my phone, I logged onto Google, oh boy, and found out that the technical term for a fast heart rate is supraventricular tachycardia. I hate it. Then I typed these two words into Google. All right, what is the title sentence? B. It says, Sadly, the problem with Dr. Google is that he isn't exactly a comfort in time of crisis. For example, wrongdiagnosis.com immediately scared me with a list of 407 possible causes. I raced to the hospital, convinced that I probably need open heart surgery. Okay, what about the next one? It's E. Four hours later, I got a diagnosis. I had a chest infection and a bad case of cyberchondria. The only consolation for the latter condition is that I'm in good company. A Microsoft survey of 1 million internet users last year found that 2% of all searches were health related. Okay, very good. For the next one, it's the unfortunately, once you have it, cyberchondria can be hard to cure. Since my trip to the hospital, I've been obsessively checking my pulse, swapping symptoms in chat rooms, and reading all about worst-case scenarios. What if the doctors got it wrong? What if the EKG machine was faulty? It's exhausting trying to convince yourself that you might have a life-threatening illness. All right, next one. C. What is C? The Microsoft study also revealed another serious problem that online information often doesn't discriminate between common and very rare conditions. Oh yeah, one, of, one in four of all articles thrown up by an internet search for headaches suggested a brain tumor as a possible cause. Although it is uh, true that this may be the cause, in fact, brain tumors develop in fewer than one in 50,000 people. People also assume that the first answers to come up in searches refer to the most common causes so if you type in mouth ulcer and see that mouth cancer has several mentions near the top you must think uh, it must be very common however this is not the case all right and the last paragraph a another problem for cyber chondriacs is that online medical information may be from an unreliable source or be out of date a recent study showed that 75% of the people who use the internet to look up information about their health do not check where the information came from or the date 
it was created. Once something has been put up on the internet, even if it's wrong, it's difficult to remove, says Sarah Jarvis, a doctor. This is a problem, especially with scare stories and also with some alternative remedies that claim to be miracle cures. But that may actually do you harm. Check the information. Sorry, I don't have time. I'm off to buy a heart rate monitor. Oh boy. Exhausting, isn't it? Very good. You did great. Now, everyone, there are some highlighted words. I need you to take your time and match them with their definitions from one to 11. You've got some matching to do. Tomorrow. Okay, everyone. Now listen and check. It's my turn. 1.40 1. Life-threatening 2. Mouth ulcer 3. Alternative remedies 4. Under the weather 5. Cancer 6. Infection 7. Heart rate 8. Surgery 9. Pulse 10. Tumor 11. Miracle cures well done, very good. But I'm not done with you. You need to read it one more time. I'll explain why. I know, I know. Okay, very good. Just read it one more time and choose the right answer. A, B or C. Last exercise in this reading. I promise. Day two. I know, I know. Don't be mad at me. All right. Number one, the first thing the journalist did after leaving her GP was, well, find out what her condition was called on her phone. All right. After realizing that she was a cyber condoriac, she worried just as much as before. Number three, one problem with health related websites on the Internet is that they make usual illnesses seem more common than they really are. And the last question, another problem with these websites is that the information may, be, may not be right. Maybe it's out of date or the source is not reliable. Very good. That's it for the reading part. All the way to part six, listening and speaking. You made it so far. This is the last set of exercises that we have for today. Listen to a radio interview with a doctor about cyberchondria. What's her general opinion of patients using health websites? Okay, listen and answer this question. It's on you. 1.41 So, Dr. Roberta, do you meet a lot of cyberchondriacs in your work? All the time, I'm afraid. It's very common these days for people to look up their symptoms on health websites on the Internet and to diagnose themselves with weird or exotic illnesses. Hmm. For example, the other day, I had a patient who came in because his back was very red and itchy. He had been looking on Internet medical sites and was absolutely convinced that he had an extremely rare skin condition. He even knew the medical name, nodular paniculitis. Hmm. But, in fact, when I examined him and talked to him, it turned out that he had spent the weekend working in his yard in the sun and his back was sunburned. So, you would prefer your patients not to check their symptoms on the Internet? No, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-health websites. I just want people to use them sensibly. The problem is that diagnosis of a condition or an illness doesn't just depend on one specific symptom that you can type into Google. Uh -huh. It depends on all kinds of other things, like a patient's appearance, their blood pressure, their heart rate, and so on. Of course. And diagnosis also depends on where you live. For example, if you live in a U.S. city and you haven't traveled overseas, it's very unlikely that you have malaria, even if you have some of the symptoms. 
What other problems are there when people use health websites? Well, you have to check carefully what kind of site it is that you are looking at. Some websites look as if they have been created by health professionals, but in fact, they've been set up by commercial companies that are trying to sell you something. Aha.、Uh-huh. Also, some healthcare sites recommend expensive treatments or medicine that is not available in all parts of the world. Are there any websites that you would recommend? Oh yes, absolutely. For example, people with chronic diseases like asthma can get a lot of help and information from online support groups. These websites have forums where you can talk to other people who have the same condition and illness, and you can usually get information about the latest research and new treatments.、Mm-hmm. And there are often online support groups for people who have unusual illnesses too. Finally, do you have any tips for all those cyberchondriacs out there? Yes, I have three. First, only look online after you've been to the doctor. If you're not feeling well, make a list of the symptoms you have that are worrying you, and go and see your doctor with this list. Then, when your doctor has told you what he or she thinks, you could take a look online. Uh huh. Second, make sure you're looking at a reliable and professional medical website. And finally, remember that common symptoms usually have common causes. So, if you have diarrhea, for example. It's much more likely to be food poisoning than the Ebola virus. Doctor Roberta, thank you very much. All right, very good. Check your answers with your friends. Well, she, in general, she thinks it's okay to look up symptoms on health websites, but only if they give reliable information. All right, so you have to check the source. Now I need you to listen again. There are four questions. Take your time. Listen and answer the questions. Let's go. One point forty-one. So, Doctor Roberta, do you meet a lot of cyberchondriacs in your work? All the time, I'm afraid. It's very common these days for people to look up their symptoms on health websites on the internet and to diagnose themselves with weird or exotic illnesses. Hmm. For example, the other day. I had a patient who came in because his back was very red and itchy. He had been looking on internet medical sites and was absolutely convinced that he had an extremely rare skin condition. He even knew the medical name, nodular panniculitis.、Hmm. But in fact, when I examined him and talked to him, it turned out that he had spent the weekend working in his yard in the sun, and his back was sunburned. So you would prefer your patients not to check their symptoms on the internet? No, don't get me wrong. I'm not anti-health websites. I just want people to use them sensibly. The problem is that diagnosis of a condition or an illness doesn't just depend on one specific symptom that you can type into Google. Uh huh. It depends on all kinds of other things, like a patient's appearance, their blood pressure, their heart rate, and so on. Of course. And diagnosis also depends on where you live. For example, if you live in a U.S. city and you haven't traveled overseas, it's very unlikely that you have malaria, even if you have some of the symptoms. What other problems are there when people use health websites? Well, you have to check carefully what kind of site it is that you are looking at. Some websites look as if they have been created by health professionals, but in fact, they've been set up by commercial companies that are trying to sell you something. Uh huh. Also, some healthcare sites recommend expensive treatments or medicine that is not available in all parts of the world. Are there any websites that you would recommend? Oh yes, absolutely. For example, people with chronic diseases like asthma. Can get a lot of help and information from online support groups. These websites have forums where you can talk to other people who have the same condition and illness, and you can usually get information about the latest research and new treatments.、Mm-hmm. And there are often online support groups for people who have unusual illnesses too. Finally, do you have any tips for all those cyberchondriacs out there? Yes, I have three. First. Only look online after you've been to the doctor. If you're not feeling well, make a list of the symptoms you have that are worrying you, and go and see your doctor with this list. Then, when your doctor has told you what he or she thinks, 
you could take a look online. Uh huh. Second, make sure you're looking at a reliable and professional medical website. And finally, remember that common symptoms usually have common causes. So if you have diarrhea, for example, it's much more likely to be food poisoning than the Ebola virus. Dr. Roberta, thank you very much. Okay. Check your answers with your friends, as always. What did a patient she saw recently think he had? And what did he really have? An extremely rare skin disease, and he was just sunburned. Number two, what four things does she say that uh, diagnosis depends on, apart from symptoms? The patient's appearance, their blood pressure, their heart rate, and where they live. What kind of website forum does she recommend? Websites with online support groups, forums. And number four, complete the three tips she gives to cyberchondriacs. Only look online after you've seen a doctor. Make sure that the website you're using is a reliable and professional medical website. And remember that common symptoms usually have common causes. Now let's speak a little bit shall we okay let's wrap this up with a partner or in small groups answer the questions ask for and give as much information as possible you know the drill so let's read the questions together which of the doctor's three tips do you think is the most important number two how often do you look up information about health and illness on the internet what websites do you usually go to? How useful is the information? Number three, do you know anyone who you think is a hypochondriac or cyberchondriac? Do you think people in your country worry a lot about their blood pressure, their cholesterol level, their eyesight? And do they uh, worry about anything else related to health? All right, speak with your friends exchange your ideas this is your gig and that's the practice for today everybody as always if you haven't liked and subscribed bless us come on and at the same time if you have a question you can comment down below and i will get back to you as you probably know and i've mentioned it before we have started membership programs so if you want to support my project you can become a member for a feasible fee and uh, you can enjoy the perks of my work. Thank you very much. I will teach you as long as I breathe. That's a promise. Bye-bye.